Well, thank you for inviting me to the bioophysics class to give a lecture on the early history of the Whispering Gallery remote biosensor. My name is Steve Arnold. I'm from the Microparticle Photophysics Laboratory at the Polytechnic. The symbol for the laboratory, this logo, shows the Chinese symbol for light, and it's light caught in a spherical bottle, you might call it. Okay. And this talk has a lot to do with that, so let me get on with it. The earliest paper uh, having to do with the subject was published uh, in 1995, submitted in 1994. It's when um, a postdoc came to us from Yale. Another faculty member came to us uh, in electrical engineering. And I was working in physics at the time, and we were all working together at the, at the Microparticle Photophysics Laboratory, the MP3L. And the discovery was that when a small microsphere was put on the surface of a shaved fiber, that is, the cladding was shaved off, and water droplet was over that microsphere, and the laser was tuned into the fiber, what was found was that there was a blinking of light into your eye as the wavelength was tuned and a corresponding intensity which changed in the following fashion showing all of these resonant modes. They were resonant modes of the microsphere. That's what was happening. The fiber was driving a wave within the microsphere which was known as a me resonance or morphological dependent resonance. Remember those letters MDR or whispering gallery mode, WGM. It's a wave which circumnavigates inside the sphere, coupled due from the outside. There's no mystery that this could build up into resonance if more of these were superimposed over time by basically the stimulation of that fiber. So suppose some antibodies were placed on the surface and they attracted antigens from solution as I supposed at the time, then what would happen basically is that you would expect the wave to move outward, scale up. And as it scaled up, it's quite clear that the circumnavigating wavelength would get longer after the layer was deposited than it was before. And the entire resonant peak, every resonant peak, would shift to longer wavelength. It's rather easy to take the similar triangles here this one and that one, and basically uh, derive a simple equation that says that the shift in wavelength divided by the original wavelength is the same as the thickness of the layer that deposits divided by the radius. I'll sometimes use the letter A for radius, so you'll see this later. Easy to derive the thickness from the shift, so if you could measure the shift, you know the thickness. And now to sort of estimate sort of the minimum uh, thickness you can measure, we could suppose that will allow the shift to be one line width. We could measure something smaller than that, but say on, on the basis of order of magnitude. On that basis, the minimum thickness is the radius divided by so-called Q factor. Now what the Q factor is, is the wavelength divided by the line width. So it's sort of simply replacing this by the line width. Q factors were known to be between 10 to the 5th and 10 to the 7th in such spheres. And so I did a very simple calculation, supposing the radius was a nice round 10 micrometers, a little smaller than was actually used, and dividing by a Q, which was intermediate at 10 to the 6th, ended up with a layer thickness of 10 to the minus 11. That lit me up. My, when I looked at that number, I checked it. It's only a tenth the diameter of a hydrogen atom. Very sensitive. The last paragraph of the 1995 paper read, the ability to measure MDRs of a single stationary microsphere in aqueous environment opens up the prospect of performing extremely sensitive adsorption and reaction measurements between species bonded to the microsphere's surface and reagents in the surrounding solution. The modest cues of 10 to the 6th, a layer having subatomic thickness, that's at 10 to the minus 11 meters, 
may be detected on a microsphere with a radius of 10 micrometers. Because this thickness is considerably less than the molecular size of a typical antigen molecule, the possibility of observing small fractions of monolayer is reasonable. In other words, I was proposing very directly a biosensor based on the scheme of excitation. I was really glad, now that I look back on this, that I actually wrote this. The current design is more compact, but in fact, the three papers I'll be describing here describe the early part up to 2002. Beyond that, hundreds of papers were published from around the world. The current design looks like this. A very small laser, not the size of our full optical bench uh, dye laser, but a very small distributed feedback laser, now feeds a fiber. You can just vary its wavelength output by changing the current through it, and that then stimulates the sphere. Griffel had done this wonderful piece of theoretical work which showed that you really didn't need to look at scattered light from the side. You could do this by uh, basically look at transmitted light, and what you would see as you tune the wavelength is a dip in the transmitted light. That was in 1996. So to recap, the first paper submitted in 94 published in 95, was on the demonstration of coupling and proposing biosensing. Griffel then worked out this coupled mode theory, as I've already described. And then finally, in 2000, I went and gave a talk at Rockefeller University. And a young student, uh, Frank Vollmer, got interested in the project and asked if he could uh, participate, took my optics course at Poly, and we began to work together. And he did the most marvelous job of demonstrating this biosensor. And as I said, hundreds of papers have followed. There are many other forms of this now. This talk is really only supposed to be up to 2002. But just to, to recap some of the things that happened after that time, Although there'll be other YouTubes that describe the time after 2002, or just to show you some configurations, I wanted to discuss the various forms that this has taken. One form created at Caltech was this microtoroid using lithograph techniques similar to those that build circuits. The work was the it, part of the group headed by Valhalla. Then there was some wonderful work, uh, which is by a fellow who is now a professor at the University of Michigan, who in fact uh, found that if he stimulated a very thin-walled capillary from the outside, he could make the field enter the inside where the fluid flow, and he could detect impurities in the fluid. Uh, I'll come back to this uh, in describing something else just after. Then there is our own work, which took the form of silica spheres, the actual thing demonstrated um, by Vollmer. And then there's the use of silicon photonic rings and disks, and a number of people contributed to this sort of thing. There's a recent review which is really quite complete by Yuzu Sun and Yudan Fan in Analytical Bio and Bioanalytical Chemistry, Volume 399, 205 to 211. And anyone who's really interested in this area probably wants to read that because it's, uh, it's quite complete and up-to-date. That's the same fan who, in fact, invented this very elegant combination of whispering gallery mode excitation and microfluidics. So for those who are interested in this area and for those who just want more information, I invite you to the webpage, www.poly.edu slash microparticle and there's a shorter form here, in which you can obtain papers and further information about the subject. This is a very fun area, this area of very high Q resonators for biosensing. I hope many of you enter into it, and I believe it'll do a lot of good. Already it's becoming something that is being transported off, over to health care people for the greater good. 
So thank you very much for listening.